be presenting on bystander intervention. So the title of this workshop is See Something, Say Something. Um, and we'll be discussing all the different ways that you can intervene um, if you are witness to any type of um, on problematic behavior uh, that you may come across. Okay. So uh, we are from the Domestic Violence Crisis Center and we offer free and confidential services to um, victims of domestic violence. And that includes a 24 seven hotline that you can call or text from, um, emergency safe houses, which are basically emergency shelters if anyone needs a safe place to go if they're fleeing an abusive relationship. We offer individual and group counseling. Um, we offer legal ag advocacy, financial advocacy, uh, and numerous training programs for both youth and adults. And this is one of our adult programs that we offer. Um, so below you can see our hotline number as well as our website um, and social media uh, page um, and you can access us, access us at any time. So before we begin, um, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping things. Um, Eloise already mentioned that this um, training will be recorded. Um, so be mindful of that. If there are any, um, if you're concerned about privacy, you can uh, if you have a specific question, you can ask us directly um, and we will be happy to answer to if you're concerned at all about um, your privacy being revealed in the recording. Uh, we, we value everyone's uh, privacy and safety and that is our number one concern. Um, so this will be an interactive presentation. So if at any time that you would like to comment, um, you can either type your answer or response in the group chat. Um, or you can use the reaction button um, located in the top right corner of your screen to raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, but most importantly, we do want to let you know that uh, some of the information that we will be discussing today um, is very sensitive and it can be triggering for some folks. So um, if that, if that um, is you, please take care of yourself. Um, if you have to take a break, um, get a drink of water, um, you know, do anything that makes you feel comfortable and makes you feel okay. Um, please go do that. No judgment here. This is a safe space. We want to make sure that everyone is being taken care of. Um, so yeah, that that is all I have right now. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Anne now. Great. Thanks so much, Nakia. Um, we're really excited to be here to talk about bystander intervention. Um, so we're going to dive in first defining bystander intervention. So let's start with bystanders. Bystanders are individuals who witness situations or events and by their presence have the opportunity to do three things. They can either help, they can do nothing, or they contribute into the event in a negative way. Um, when we think of bystanders, we think of people who stand by um, and we want those individuals who are standing by to intervene or to do something um, in the problematic situation uh, to hopefully reduce the harm, right? Or to reduce the problem. So that's what we're assuming when we're talking about bystander intervention. It's empowering everyone to intervene, uh, to reduce problems and to intervene in problematic situations and their precursors. We're gonna talk about what we mean by those precursors. Um, additionally, um, I also like to use the term bystander approach or being an active bystander. Uh, when we think of bystander intervention or when I think of bystander intervention, I typically imagine some really bad thing happening and uh, someone intervening by going up to that person, directly challenging them. Um, they are saving the day. They have their hero cape on and they're ready to go, right? Um, but that's just not how it always works out in real life. Um, um, that's not always safe for people to do, to directly confront uh, people, right? So um, thinking through how we can have an approach or be an active bystander um, is a kind of a, a nicer way um, to think about this that isn't as scary. Additionally, today we're going to be focusing on domestic violence, how we can be uh, active bystanders when we witness domestic violence or attitudes and beliefs that lay the way for domestic violence, we're also going to be talking about bystander intervention in terms of racial violence. 
Um, and we're doing this for a few reasons. At DVCC, we recognize um, and have seen the impact of racial violence and injustice when working with domestic violence victims. We know that domestic, vi uh, uh, domestic violence survivors of color have disproportionate rates of domestic violence. Um, and there are um, safety considerations and barriers for survivors of color in reaching out after experiencing domestic violence. So we have to be talking about racial violence in addition to domestic violence. Also, um, you know, people right now are really wanting to um, have the tools to combat racism. Uh, we're having conversations about how we can be actively anti-racist. And so um, that's why it's so important that we're talking about both of those issues today. And bystander intervention skills are really applicable to any kind of problematic situation. So what are some benefits of bystander intervention? Why do we have a, a whole session dedicated to this? Well, there are a few things. Bystander intervention puts responsibility on the community to prevent violence instead of on victims. Um, so um, a community, when there is violence, says, how did we as a community allow this to happen? Why did no one intervene or step in to help that allowed it to escalate to violence? That's a very different response than uh, what some communities have of blaming the victim for what's happened to them. And with this responsibility being on the entire community, this then shifts the responsibility to men and women. So no longer thinking of domestic violence as a women's issue, and it can get everyone involved. Additionally, we also know that there are multiple points of contact for when someone can intervene, right? And we talked about in a previous workshops about domestic violence being on a continuum, being a pattern of behaviors. Um, we know with that pattern, there are multiple points of contact where someone can intervene and help the situation. And last but not least, bystander intervention is prevention focused. We're talking about preventing violence before it happens. So today we're not just going to be talking about how to help and support victims, which is important and we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how we can challenge uh, problematic attitudes and beliefs that contribute to domestic violence in our society. And that really is prevention focused. Okay. Bystander intervention. Um, how do we move from being an inactive bystander to an active bystander? Well, if it was easy, uh, we would do it all the time, right? Uh, but there are some steps that we have to go through in order to intervene. So the first step is that we have to notice the event. We actually have to look up from our phone, um, have our, our earphones out, and actually notice that this event is happening or this situation is happening. The second thing that has to happen is we have to interpret it as a problem, right? If it's not problematic to us, we're not going to do anything about it. Then we have to feel responsible to act. We have to believe that we are responsible um, and that we can help the situation. And so um, this is a difficult step because in society, we're told to mind our own business. Um, we're afraid of confrontation, right? We don't want to cause a scene um, or we think that someone else will help. So there are many ways in our minds that we rationalize not feeling responsible to act. Then we have to possess the skills to act and then finally intervene. So tonight, we are going to be focusing on okay, two steps to bystander intervention. We're going to start by talking about interpreting it as a problem, and then we're going to wrap up by talking about those skills to intervene. So again, we're talking about bystander intervention as these five steps. So let's start with interpreting it as a problem. So this is our domestic violence iceberg. And let's start with the things that are above the surface of the water uh, of this iceberg. These are socially unacceptable things that almost everyone in society is going to say is not okay, is problematic, and requires some kind of response or intervention. We have domestic violence homicide, severe forms of physical abuse like strangulation, and sexual abuse. 
So we're talking about bystander intervention. Almost all of us are going to agree that that tip of the iceberg above the surface requires intervention. But if we really want to focus on prevention, we also have to intervene and challenge the attitudes and beliefs and the actions that are underneath the surface of this iceberg that allow it to float. So when we are looking at bystander, ooh, excuse me, I skipped a slide. Sorry about that. Okay, back to this. Um, when we look at bystanders, we look, can see victim blaming. We do need to challenge victim blaming and the idea that victims are responsible for their abuse. Um, we also need to be able to challenge the idea that this is a private matter that we don't get involved in. Right? And so victim blaming comes through in many different ways. We hear things, people saying, uh, for example, well, if she didn't flirt with that waiter at the restaurant, he wouldn't have got upset with her and hit her. Or um, she stuck by his side for so many years, what else did she expect would happen? And so those are attitudes that are blaming victims. And we know no matter what, perpetrators and abusers need to be held accountable for their actions, right? So victim blaming does require us to challenge that and to intervene. We also have below the surface domestic violence jokes, um, excuses for abusers behavior or assuming good intentions. So abusers are typically um, well liked in their community, well known, upstanding citizens, uh, they do much for their community. And so when individuals hear about domestic violence, they say, well, they give so much to the community, you know, that can't be, that can't be true, right? Oh, or, but they do so much for the community that it must not be true and um, they must have, that must have been a mistake, right? Assuming those good intentions on that person. So again, these attitudes, beliefs, and norms that we have below the surface of the iceberg are just as important as intervening and challenging those attitudes and ideas as the things that are above the iceberg that are socially unacceptable. Another graphic for us um, to make this point further is this uh, pyramid. This one has both domestic violence and sexual violence on it. You can see at the top that we have death and violence. Um, so domestic violence homicide. We have police brutality and hate crimes under the racial violence side. Again, those are things as a society uh, we know that we have to do something about, they are not okay. Most people would say, yes, we have to intervene and challenge those behaviors. But we wanna focus also on the attitudes and beliefs at the bottom of this pyramid that allow the things on top of it to happen. They lay the foundation for those behaviors. And so looking at the domestic violence side, we have attitudes and beliefs, um, things like boys will be boys. Um, this notion that um, males have it wired in their DNA to uh, be destructive or um, have bad behavior, right? And to use that as an excuse for bad behavior or particularly bad behavior that's hurting females. Uh, we have possessive language like your mind, someone feeling like they have um, ownership of their partner. As we go up the pyramid, we again see victim blaming and domestic violence jokes. Um, on the racial violence side, um, at the bottom, some attitudes and beliefs, uh, things like someone saying, I don't see color, or that kind of notion of color blindness, which really stops people from examining the impact of race and bias and racism and really ignores the reality of people's lived experiences. This also ties into domestic violence as well um, as we see um, uh, individuals, um, BIPOC or um, victims of color, not being believed when they come forward about their story and experiencing domestic violence. Or we also see forgiveness of abusers if they are white, knowing that um, abusers of color often experience longer uh, jail sentencing times and um, 
that the trend to forgive abusers more if they are white. And so again, uh, on the racial violence side, we want to intervene and challenge the racial slurs, the racial jokes, these attitudes and beliefs that lay the foundation of racial violence. Um, also talking about racial violence, we wanna talk about microaggressions. Uh, microaggressions are subtle or unintentional ways that people communicate bias towards historically marginalized groups. And we wanna focus on this to show uh, the cumulative impact that some of these attitudes and beliefs can have on individuals. Um, before we move on to that video, does anyone have any questions so far? Does this pyramid or iceberg make sense? And do we understand how it connects to bystander intervention? You can write it in the chat. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Okay. Oh, oh, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, you're on a roll, Anne. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, I am going... Oh, oh, we have one question. What does BIPOC stand for? Thank you for that question. So BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. And Nakia, can you tell us why that term um, has come about and why that distinction can be important? Absolutely. And it's just... Um, it it is a better term to accommodate more people instead of just saying um, communities of color or people of color it it um, it's, uh, better distinguishes uh, the group that we are specifies the group that we are talking about so it's, it's you'll see it a lot I didn't know how to pronounce it at first either but it's pronounced BIPOC yeah and it's to highlight that people of color, that's a really broad umbrella term. And um, that within that umbrella, those different groups have very different experiences. So the experience of an indigenous person is gonna be different than one of someone who's black. Um, so it kind of uh, um, acknowledges those differences. Was there another question, Nakia? Oh, you're muted. That's all for now. Okay. Okay, so I am going to share this video. We're going to watch about microaggressions to, to show us the cumulative impact that they can have on individuals. Still don't think that microaggressions are a problem? Oh, you're so well-spoken. Oh. Just imagine, instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while... No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland? Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date... Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you gonna have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the Redskins name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. <gasps> I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Can you me shopping so advice? Oh, I don't have shared of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm, maybe you should try less challenging major. Ow, oh, what a dream. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. It looked like he was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. Okay, could you hear that? Yeah, okay. Um, so going back to um, our PowerPoint, uh, what did you all think of that um, that video and the idea of microaggressions being like mosquito bites? Any thoughts on that? Okay. 
So, um, one of the first steps of bystander intervention was known as the event. The second one was interpret it as problematic, right? Um, so when we're thinking of things being problematic, we want to think about the entire domestic violence and racial violence pyramid and challenging the attitudes and beliefs on the bottoms and the same for the iceberg. Okay, so now moving on to the bystander intervention skills. And we like to talk about um, the five Ds when talking about bystander intervention skills. It is direct, distract, delegate, document, and delay. Um, so let's start with direct. Um, there are many different ways that we can be direct um, in challenging the behavior. So we can challenge the behavior, say your behavior is not okay. We can also use an I statement. Um, so making it about how we feel. So I feel really uncomfortable by what you just said to me right then or how you were treating that person. An I statement can be helpful because instead of kind of pointing your finger at them and putting them on the defense, you're making it about yourself. I also really like the skill of appealing to their best self. Um, this skill is when you approach someone um, and tell and um, say, you know, I know that you're a good person and you don't mean harm, but, and then explain how they are doing harm. Instead of going up to them and saying, how dare you do this? You're a horrible person. We're saying, actually, I know that you're a good person and you don't mean harm by it. We're going to get a very different response from someone if we approach them in that way. We also know that group intervention can be helpful because there is power in numbers. And we can also make it personal or bring it home for them. Asking them, how would you like it if someone treated, you know, your sister that way, right? Or how would you like it if someone talked to you that way? We also have a distraction. So derailing the incident by interrupting it, diffusing the situation by separating the two people involved or asking questions. I think this ask question skill is really important uh, because it allows us to get more information about the situation. So we can ask questions to the person engaging in the problematic behavior. We can ask questions to the victim or the target of that behavior um, to help us better assess. And just asking a question um, can diffuse and distract from what is happening. Um, we can also delegate and get an authority figure or another person if it's unsafe or uncomfortable to intervene. So maybe we're going to uh, get another person who maybe knows this individual a little bit better, who can be more successful in intervening. Or we can also document what's happened or we can delay our intervention. And this is okay. Uh, we can delay the intervention because it's unsafe for us to do something or we're uncomfortable. Maybe we're uncomfortable based on our own lived experiences or maybe it's unsafe because of the different identities that we have. Um, if that's the case, we can delay doing something in that moment, but possibly follow up with that victim afterwards to provide support or resources or even following up with the abuser or the person engaging in that problematic behavior to talk to them after the fact. Maybe give yourself some time to get your thoughts together and maybe um, that person engaging that behavior will be in a better space to hear it. So again, um, we don't want to just think about these direct confrontational challenge beha challenging behavior skills. We wanna think of more indirect ways that we can help or ways that we can approach this individual so they can uh, listen to what we have to say and not be on the defense. And we've been talking about safety. And so again, it's really important that we make sure we're safe in this process. And typically we are um, safest when we're intervening with others and we're not closely, um, closely related to what's happening, whether that's emotionally or physically. And we know that we're least safe when we're close to the situation and we are alone. So these are things for us to consider in this decision-making process about what skill we want to use to intervene and whether it is safe.
Okay, so now um, Nakia is going to take over and we are going to do some scenarios to think through how we might intervene. And I want us to think through um, or reflect back on these different skills that we just talked about. Any questions before we move on to, to our scenarios? Okay. I don't see any. Okay. Um, so before I launch this poll, um, I just want to uh, preface it by saying that there is no wrong answer. So a lot of times when we take a quiz, there's, there's like one right answer. And I know in previous workshops, we did these polling questions and there was a right answer. Um, but the options that you're given, all of them are absolutely okay. And we're going to talk about them and dissect them. Um, so don't feel any pressure like, oh God, they all seem like good answers. They all, all, they all are good answers. Um, and they, um, I just want you to pick the one that you'd feel most comfortable doing. Okay, so for the first poll question, um, I, here it is, I'll read it out loud. It says you are, uh, oh, sorry, wrong one. Let me do first one. Apologies for that. Okay. Let's try that again. Okay, so uh, at a party, you notice a friend talking quietly but forcefully to their partner in the corner. They grab their partner's arm, shake them, and get in their face. You can't hear what is being said, but you see the partners trying to physically pull away. Do you, one, walk up uh, to the situation and ask if everything is okay? Two, Say nothing at the party, but text your friend's partner the next day to see if they're okay. Or three, say nothing at the party, but meet up with your friend the following day and ask about the incident. So I'll give you um, a little time to answer because these, these scenarios are a little long, um, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. Okay, I'll wait another 10 seconds. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll now and I'm going to share the results with you. All right, so some of you said um, you would B, say nothing at the party, but text your friend's partner uh, the next day to see if they're okay. Um, so could anyone um, type in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can um, unmute you to discuss why um, that would be um, the best option for you as a bystander to um, not directly intervene in that moment, but to follow up with the victim the following day to make sure that they're okay. Okay, it, one person says, I feel that confronting them with the possible abuser there could make them unsafe later. Absolutely, thank you so much for um, typing that in. Um, I agree with you, um, especially if you confront them in that moment, uh, maybe the abuse will stop in that instance, but you have no idea um, how the abuser is going to act later on in private. And this, um, by confronting them directly, it could possibly escalate things later on for the victim. Um, so this would be a very um, safe and neutral way to um, still be effective um, by checking in with the victim the following day. Um, and then from there, you can see how you can support them if they want to talk about it, if they don't want to talk about it. But this is a great um, way to still do something without being, you know, what we think, as Anne mentioned earlier, that like superhero that's like busting down the doors and like beating up the abusers. Very good. And now other people said, um, again, say nothing at the party, but meet up with you, uh, your friend the following day and ask about the incident. Would anyone like to, um, to say why they would feel comfortable talking to their friend um, rather than talking to the victim? 
It's also, it's easy to say everything is fine over text, which is why I thought face, ooh, I like that. So which I, which is why I thought face to face would be best. Absolutely. So um, that you are absolutely correct. Um, you could it's very easy to lie over text or um, to just kind of gloss things over and a face to face, um, face to face meeting would be best because you um, are right there with them in that in that real time. You also don't know if maybe um, the abuser is monitoring their text messages. So maybe they're going to say like everything is okay because uh, they know that the abuser is checking in. Um, on them or, or watching them. So uh, that's another great point that you brought up. Thank you for that. Um, anyone want to answer why they said say nothing at the park, but meet up. Oh, you already said that. Great. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing this poll. And I'm going to launch the second question. These are great answers so far. Thank you so much for your participation. Um, so here's the second one. So uh, you are eating Thanksgiving dinner with your family when your uncle makes a racist joke at the dinner table that makes everyone feel uncomfortable. Do you A, say, I don't get it, and ask them to explain the joke and why it is funny? B, immediately redirect the conversation to something else. C, say nothing at the dinner table dinner table, but later pull your uncle to the side and let him know his joke bothered you with an I statement. Or D, say, I know you don't mean to be offensive, but that joke was racist and I don't find it funny. Please don't say that again. So go ahead and vote now. Okay, very good. I'll give you about um, five more seconds to answer. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And I'm going to share the results. And um, some of you said, say, I know you don't mean to be offensive, uh, but that joke was racist and I don't find it funny. Please don't say that again. Um, so that was a very, very direct way uh, to let your uncle know that what, what he said was offensive. Um, anybody want to comment why they feel comfortable doing that and why the, to them was that was the best response versus um, some of the other choices that were up there? And again, you can type your answers in the chat or you can use the reaction button um, and that will prompt us to unmute you so that you can speak. Okay, I think the direct response is best, uh, but confrontation is hard. Redirection is easier and doesn't put the person on the spot. Yeah, that's a great point, um, especially um, if they if it's going to embarrass the other person. Um, maybe uh, they aren't going to be so likely to change if they are feeling hurt or, or embarrassed by what you said. But if you kind of redirect it um, and maybe approach them later, that could be um, a great way to handle the situation. Um, but I also love this one because uh, you say, please don't say that again. So this is a great example of setting boundaries um, with with people um, and boundaries. We talk about it all the time. We think it's so important to set those limits um, with others on, on how you like to be treated and how you like to be respected. And I think this is a very um, respectful way to to let your, your uncle know, whether that's directly in that moment um, in front of others or by pulling them aside. 
Oh, okay. My another person said my family is pretty cool about speaking your mind and making your opinion known. I did almost go with redirect because I'm not a fan of confrontation. If it wasn't family, I might handle it differently. Okay, so that's another great point. Um, so this example involved family members. Um, where you may feel a little bit more comfortable uh, directly confronting them because you have that type of relationship, whereas you wouldn't do it um, with a stranger or with a friend or someone that you don't really know very well, maybe like a colleague at work. Um, so that's an excellent point that these um, these tactics or, or skills will change depending on who you are interacting with um, and your level of comfort with each person. Very good. Okay, so I'm we're going to do one more. Okay, so this last one, you are watching a movie uh, with a friend that features a relationship with domestic violence. After it ends, you begin discussing the movie with each other and your friend says, she was so dumb, I would never let someone treat me that way. So you could either A, say, actually, I think she was pretty smart using the very few resources she had to get out of that very difficult situation. B, you could say, I find it interesting that you're focusing on her actions instead of his actions. He was the one that was being abusive in the relationship. What you're doing is victim blaming. Or C, ask, why do you think she was dumb? Do you think it might be difficult to recognize red flags when you're in an abusive relationship? So go ahead and vote now. Um, and we'll discuss this last poll in a second. Okay, I'm going about 10 more seconds to answer. Okay, I'll end the poll and share the results. So um, the, the majority of you actually said, actually, I think she was pretty smart uh, using the very few resources she had to get out of that very difficult situation. Um, so does anyone wanna, anybody wanna comment why you would feel comfortable saying this over that? Or you can tell me um, why uh, do you think she was dumb um, and asking the question about recognizing red flags, especially if you were here before and, and we talked about um, red flags. And remember all these responses are correct. They, none of them are incorrect. Um, they're just different ways uh, to use the bystander tools that Anne mentioned um, before. So these are just different examples. But while we're waiting for responses, Anne, did you have a favorite out of all of these? Which one would you probably go with? Um, I actually like the one that no one chose. Um, the challenging victim blaming. Um, I just find that we're, we're so quick to blame victims. And so it's really helpful to always reframe that thought. Um, and, um, you know, framing it as like, oh, I find it interesting that you're doing that. Um, and, and labeling it uh, can be powerful. So that would be what I would choose. And again, it, uh, each of us are gonna have different choices and that's okay. Uh, there's no right way. Um, the, the right way is the one that feels most comfortable and authentic to you. Absolutely. So some comments are people are saying, I'd probably discuss the cycle of abuse and point out that it didn't start out abusive. Very good. So um, so for those uh, of you or that are unfamiliar with the cycle of abuse, we like to say that relationships um, are very fluid um, and it and there are probably there's gonna be a pattern of these unhealthy behaviors. Um, so the relationship probably like in the beginning of the movie, it was beautiful and romantic and lovely and, and rainbows and butterflies, um, but there would be a pattern of these unhealthy behaviors or red flags. Um, and it, oftentimes it's hard for victims to, to recognize it in, that, in, um, in the early stage of the relationship, especially when they are kind of in that honeymoon phase. So uh, this one person was saying that um, it's important to, to discuss it and point out that it, the relationship didn't start off abusive. Very good. And then someone else said, I would just like to help the friend better understand 
why she thought the woman was dumb. Absolutely. And I love that all um, majority of these uh, options, they ask questions. So um, they ask questions for clarification and for better understanding, um, not to like trap the other person, but just to educate the other person and to educate yourself and maybe um, start this com start a conversation uh, so that you can better understand their point of view and then you can share your point of view and you guys can you know come to a mutual understanding so uh, bystander intervention a lot of times we think it's kind of like caustic and like very hostile um, and kind of in your face confrontational but it doesn't have to be that way at all um, you can um, you can it's just about starting a conversation sometimes um, and and having people understand a different points of view very good. So I we're going to jump into the remaining part of the presentation. Um, so just give me a moment to now share my screen. Okay, let's see. Okay, I'm going to jump to Oops. One second. While Nakia sets that up, I'll kind of help with this transition. So we're going to wrap up tonight um, now after we've done our scenarios by talking about how to help a friend um, who is experiencing domestic violence. And we are also going to talk about how to challenge or to um, uh, have a conversation with someone who might be the abuser in a situation. Thank you. Okay. have to go through this. Um, so the first thing that we're going to cover is to how to talk to a friend um, if they are the one that's being abusive in the relationship. And it's um, important to keep a couple things in mind. Um, first off, you want to make sure that you are coming um, from a place of love and concern and not necessarily to um, embarrass your friend or, or shame them um, into um, better behavior. Um, it's going to go over a lot smoother if you can say, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about you. I care about you. I see that this is going on and, and it's not healthy, right? That's going to go over a lot easier than saying, you know, you're an awful person. You need to stop right now, right? So you want to keep that in mind. Um, also, you want to uh, make sure that if it's safe, again, we, we always um, emphasize safety, that if you are going to confront a friend that it's safe for you to do so, that um, you, you feel comfortable that they're not going to lash out violently at you or violently at the victim. Um, and here are a couple of things that you can um, do or, or say um, if you are going to approach a friend that's being abusive. So we kind of put this chart together. So instead of saying this or doing these actions, you can do this instead. So for instance, instead of staying silent or ignoring it, you can um, talk to your friend and start the conversation by just saying, you know, you seem really angry sh or stressed out lately. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Um, and that kind of just opens them up and lets them know that you are there to support them and to listen to them and kind of hear them out. And then that can kind of um, start the conversation to discuss the, the um, problematic behavior. Another one, instead of making a video or egging them on um, or even laughing at the situation, you can say, you know, you and blank seem to be fighting a lot lately. How are you feeling about them? And kind of doing like a relationship check in to see like, are they even still interested? Like what what's going on? Um, or another thing that you can do is say, you know, how do you think they felt when you said that or when you did that, right? Kind of, again, what we said before about bring, making it personal, bringing it home, kind of flipping it and saying like, well, how would you feel if someone talked to you that way or treated you that way? Um, or if you notice that they're being um, controlling, instead of saying you've got them whipped, you can say instead, you know, why do you feel like you need to know where they are all the time? Do they always know where you are too? Um, and again, this is kind of a great way to open the conversation and discuss um, what, what are healthy behaviors in a relationship and what are those unhealthy behaviors or things that are, are not okay. 
Um, so these are a couple of things if your friend is the abuser. I know it can be really hard to um, confront someone, but especially if you care about them and if you're, if you're close with them, um, you want to see the best for them. And it's important to uh, to separate the, the person from the behavior. So um, they aren't a bad person, but you don't like what they're doing right now, right? So that's, that's uh, another way to approach the conversation. And that's going to go over better than just kind of like, you know, canceling them completely. So if you see a friend um, that's in an abusive relationship, so now we're talking about a friend if they are the victim in the situation, um, you want to focus on their rights in the relationship and what they deserve. So again, we're going to talk about those healthy, um, those healthy things, uh, those healthy green flags that we discussed uh, back in the, our first part of our presentation, you know, um, respect in the relationship, com healthy communication, setting boundaries, um, equality, equal decision making. You want to emphasize those things and highlight those things and that's going to be like a good way to kind of um, compare what's currently happening and and kind of let them know what they deserve in a relationship um, and like we talked about green flags you also want to discuss the warning signs or the red flags so if you notice that they um, are getting isolated from their friends and family or that their partner is acting extremely jealous or constantly checking in those are going to be red flags and it's absolutely okay to address that and say hey i noticed that um they checked your phone your partner checked your phone last night like do they do that often how do you feel about that right um so again it's just asking open-ended questions to get the conversation started and most importantly you want to spend time with them especially if their abusive partner is trying to isolate them from friends and family it's really important that you still maintain that um, relationship and and that connection so that they know, even if they're not ready to leave now or end the relationship, that they do have someone that they can talk to um, and get advice from or just spend time with and they're not alone in the situation. So that's important. Um, some other ways that you can start the conversation, um, you can say, you know, you deserve to be respected and to have your thoughts and opinions valued. Um, and that kind of is going to, it's going to counteract whatever uh, negative um, behavior or verbal abuse that, the, that their partner um, is, is spewing at them. Or, you know, I've noticed that they always text you and want to know where you are. How does that make you feel? Do you feel like you have your own space and time? So again, asking these open-ended questions um, and not just like, are they being abusive towards you? Yes or no kind of thing, right? You want to really kind of gauge how they're feeling and open the conversation and continue the conversation from there. Um, and then lastly, I just want to share um, this, this graphic of how to help a friend. I kind of to me, it reminds me of like balancing the scales because we talked previously that abusive relationships is all about one person having all the power and control. So it's very unbalanced. So um, over here, we have the abuser's tactics and in the middle, we have the impact on the victim. And at the end, we have the response or a way that we can start to balance that scale again and give the victim um, back the power and control in the relationship. So for instance, if the uh, tactic is emotional abuse and the victim feels like they have no outer resources. As a friend or as a bystander, you can discuss um, support systems and provide referrals. So, you know, talk about the people in their lives that um, can help in the situation, friends that they trust, family members that they can trust, um, talked about provider referrals, such as Domestic Violence Crisis Center, right? You can take down our information and you can refer them to our hotline and we are ready and um, happy to help. Um, or if it's emotional abuse and they feel like they don't have any inner resources. So if their partner is constantly belittling them, telling them that they're, you know, awful, that they're good for nothing, that they're, you know, that nobody wants them, you want to point out their strengths and start to build them up again. And you also want to believe them and validate their feelings, right? They are probably feeling um, worthless, like they have no self-esteem. Uh, but if you have some, if, but if you have someone in your corner, even if it's just one person that says, no, like, I believe you, you are, I believe everything that you're saying, and you're not crazy, your feelings are valid, that's going to start to, to build up their self-esteem and allow them to have more power in their life. Or um, if they're suffering from feeling guilty, um, especially if the abusive partner is constantly blaming them for things, um, you want to discuss the dynamics of domestic violence and uh, again reiterate that it's not their fault, that they are not to blame, um, that it's the, it's the abuser's um, problem, that they are the one that's being abusive and it's not your fault, right? Um, like we talked previously about the victim blaming. 
um, if they're suffering from physical abuse or threats um, and the victim is fearing for their safety, um, you want to remind them of their rights, again, what they deserve in a healthy relationship. And you also want to refer them to professionals um, such as ourselves at the Domestic Violence Crisis, Crisis Center to make sure that um, they can safety plan with um, an expert, right? Because we uh, know that um, leaving an abusive relationship is the most dangerous time for a victim. So we want to make sure that they have all the resources um, and, and tools at their disposal when they are ready to leave um, so that they can do so in a safe manner. And then finally, um, if the abuser is the point of reference and, you know, the victim is always referring to them, that's like the ultimate control that they have, right? And it leads to them feeling like they have no control. Again, you want to refer them to GVCC, to safety plan. And you want to just, um, again, start to build them up to give back that power and control. That's all um, it is about, is allowing them to make the, the, their own choices um, in their life and in and, and, and their relationships. So um, again, this, these are um, our, our hotline number and our business line, um, as well as our website and social media pages. So if you want to take a screenshot of that, um, so you can always have it handy and um, at your disposal to give to anyone um, when you are ready to, to uh, be a, a bystander and intervene. Um, and that is all. So we have a few minutes uh, for any questions or comments about anything um, from this presentation or any of the, the workshops. Um, feel free to put it in the chat. Yeah, it can be a question or possibly like one of your takeaways from today or something you learned. I think one of my takeaways um, from today is really um, thinking about how we can um, challenge abusers' behaviors. We talk a lot about how to help and support victims, which is so important. Victims need our help and support. When we're talking about prevention and preventing violence, we also need to challenge that behavior and make sure abusers um, are held accountable. Um, and the people who can do that are the people that are already in their lives, right, and are friends with them. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that was a great point. And I think for me, I, um, I love that there were a number of different approaches. I mean, me, I just personally, I'm not a very confrontational person. So I love that there are different ways that I can still intervene and help um, while still making sure that I'm feeling comfortable and safe in this situation. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So thank you so much. This was so helpful. I appreciate you giving your time tonight. Okay, open end questions are so helpful. Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we really hope that um, you were able to take something away from it and that you uh, feel empowered now um, to go out in the world and, and, um, and be able to speak up and help others.